I, Arfa Kamal, student manager of Sri Balaji Society, is privileged to introduce a dynamic personality, Mr. K. V. Ganesh, President Finance and CFO in TVA Sri Chakra Limited. Sir completed CA, CS, dissertation in taxation from Institute of Chartered Accountant of India. Sir even did senior management program from IIM Calcutta. He has been bestowed with the top 100 awards in 2016 and 2017 from CFO India. Sir was honored as one of the most influential CFO in the country by Chartered Institute of Management Accounts, UK, in 2016. Now, may I request Mr. K. V. Ganesh, sir, to share his experiences with us. Sir, the dice is all yours. You. I was told, uh, in fact, I asked uh, Dr. Rashmi, what's the topic I need to talk? I was told the, the, the theme of the symposium is moving into the 21st century. So I just thought, look, we are already 17 years into the century. We are in 2017. We still have 83 years to go. So I said, fine, that's okay. One sixth only over, five sixths still left. So that made me a little more confident. I said, look, let's do whatever we perhaps have learnt in the initial 17 years and probably take this experience and try to understand what is that we need to do as we go along. Let me kind of give you a, a very broad kind of a insight how the country has moved and with that of course the corporates and all of us because end of the day you know the country is the big thing. You, are you all familiar with the Venn diagram? You do the Venn diagram, right? In Max, yeah? The Venn diagram, the big circle, the country. Then you draw something inside, which is really the corporates. Then inside, all of us. So we are all part of the overall syndrome, overall, you know, um, enterprise, which is really the country. How was India? 30 years back. Any, any guesses? Anybody wants to take a shot? I know you are, you're all very young. I'm, you would not have, maybe your fathers, your, your grandfathers would have told you something. Was the country the same 30 years back? What was different? Sorry? I didn't hear. Can I? Is it? Okay, I'm going Okay, so let me understand. What did you say? Technology. That, yeah, that's a point. Okay. Infrastructure. Fine. Are we are we already there? Infrastructure. We are happy with it. We're not. Okay. Education. Okay. In what way? Sorry. Level of education. Oh, I mean, I mean, all of you are very proud, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, sorry. Sorry? Digitalization, okay. Transportation. I think good points. All of them very good points. See, the country was extremely different. Somebody mentioned about telecommunications. Imagine a life without mobiles. No mobiles. Today, without a mobile, can you even think of going anywhere? You can't. Sometimes people take the mobile to the washrooms also. That's a different matter. I do remember I went to the U.S. first time, I think it was in 2003. I was deputed when I used to work for uh, HP. I was deputed to take over a different role. And, you know, you are excited. I mean, you are excited because you are in the U.S., dream country, you know, uh, I mean. Look, I, I was fortunately in the Bay Area, so obviously that's the place where generally people like to be. So I kept calling my wife and my, my folks back, and vice versa. She also started calling me back and forth. Imagine what was the bill, telephone bill, which came to me. 8,000? 
dollars. Now it depends what is the dollar value there. <laughs> Let me put it in repeat terms. It's more easy to comprehend. My bill for one month was 1,17,000 rupees. And I fell from the chair. I said, look, this is gone. My job is gone anyway. So let me openly go and tell my boss I have done a mistake. I have done a mistake because I didn't know that this is what roaming, international roaming is all about. Today, my son is in the US. I mean, I mean all of us have relatives outside. What we do, we do all kinds of things. We do Skype, we do FaceTime, we may get into something else, tweeters. It doesn't cost us even one rupee. Telecommunications, big thing has changed. Infrastructure, very important. People, you know, 30 years back could not have imagined traveling from one place to another. I mean, um, Pune to Mumbai, <laughs> you just do it in, what, few hours, right? Did it exist 30 years back? No. The question is, is it, what is the direction now? The country is moving. We are slowly but surely stepping into a different zone, different orbit altogether. Has it, has it been the same over the last 30 years or has it been sort of in patches, Somewhere it's more fast, somewhere it's more slow. Any guesses? When did it all start? I mean, any idea? 1991. What was 1991 famous for? Sorry? Okay. So what was the scene? Uh, let me ask you the question. What was the situation in 1991? And that would have meant what? Country would have gone bankrupt. So just to add to what he said, uh, there's a very good observation. We had something like 26 million. And today, you know what's the forex reserves we have? 403 billion. The country is fast, moving at a great pace. And imagine, we are so sad. You know, I mean, the press is very fond of doing all these uh, stories. 5.6% growth rate. Oh, India's going in a bad direction, demonetization, GST, all has put us into a block. The question is, is India in a such a bad direction? No. We are still one of the fastest growing nations, if not the fastest. So, should we be happy? Should we think that this is what 21st century is all about? Or is the country headed, I mean, we have already achieved whatever we are, we are supposed to achieve? Are we... Are we, I mean, should we be complacent? Is the question. We have just made a beginning. You rightly said infrastructure. When we go outside India, we go to Singapore, what makes us feel very happy? I mean, just give me one reason. What makes us feel very happy when you go outside? Sorry? Infrastructure. The roads. See, we are very happy with the, everything, the toilets around. I mean, the, unfortunately, in a country, prime ministers talk about toilets all the time. I mean, this is like, but it's a good point he's taken. But at that level, somebody had to voice out. Why? Because the country lacks it. The hygiene factor is something which we still need to improve around. Infrastructure, still the roads are bumpy. Still, you know, we have problems. I mean, see... Country is not just Mumbai, Bangalore, or Pune, or Delhi, you know. Country is far, far wider than that. People still live below poverty line. Out of 1.3 billion, I don't know how many people stay with food not being available. So that's the country currently. Now, how have corporates reacted to all this? What has happened over the last 30 years? Just imagine, I mean, just give me one or two instances how companies could have worked 30 years back and what has happened now in 21st century. Any, any guesses? Okay. Okay, let me add to this. You know, those days, I mean, I remember I started my career with one of the, you know, paper manufacturing company. 
And just think of it. We were told not to even, even use telephone calls and keep it very, very you know, limited. We were writing letters, sending by couriers. That was the state of the economy. That was the mindset of corporates. Today, it's, as we know, it's completely different, right? Completely different. What was the kind of uh, thought process? Were companies happy trying to go outside India? I mean, did any acquisitions happen? Did companies go out and look at expanding beyond India and all? I mean, did it ever happen in the 90s? In anything, any guesses? Any acquisitions outside India? Not really. People were happy. People were happy. Mujhe dal roti mil raha. I'm happy. I'm running my enterprise. I'm, and mostly the businesses were small. Corporates were very happy. It was a highly still a regulated country, regulated market. There were a lot of laws which existed. There used to be a law called Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, FERA. FERA, remember, I'm using the word FERA. Draconian law. You will be arrested like this for the smallest of small thing. The change what has happened in the 21st century is there has been a, a paradigm shift how corporates have started reacting and how governments have started thinking. FERA was replaced by a new law called FEMA. Now FEMA says what? You do whatever, I, don't, I mean I'm okay. I've just given you a broad guideline for banks to operate. You operate within the limited uh, whatever I've given to you. Every you know, Companies Act, Income Tax Act, I mean, I don't know whether you are even ever, 1967, you earned 100 rupees. You know how much will come to your pocket? Just take a wild guess. I mean, I, I'm sure in this room there are a lot of people who do wild guesses. How much will come to your pocket? 32, okay? 85 will come to your pocket? Sorry? 15 will come to your pocket, okay? Any couple of more guesses? 40. Shall I tell you the answer? Two and a half will come to your pocket. 97.5% income tax. 1967, we are talking. I mean, just think of it. Why should somebody show profits? Why should somebody look at trying to be open, transparent, etc., etc.? So the, the thing is, now the government realized over the years, as India matured as a country, that corporates also have to be believed. You've got to believe your people. You got to believe your enterprises. So they have been phasing out. And today India has one of the lowest tax rates. In fact, it's lower than the United States. United States, the maximum peak rate is 38%. We are at 30%. Of course, there are some surcharges, but 30% is the rate. There's a clamor now. In fact, there's a lot of talk that we should even abolish income tax and get into an expenditure tax, I mean, which is perhaps likely at some stage. So the country is moving. The country is moving. There are pain points. I, I know uh, all of us are familiar with demonetization. Who isn't? I mean, all of us knew. Mr. Narendra Modi was born on 17th of September. The number eight rules for him. It's a Saturn number. Okay. I don't know how many of you believe all this, but eight. And he made this announcement exactly at 8 p.m. on radio on the 8th of November. For some reason, he chose 8. Coincidence or deliberate, one doesn't know. Demonetization, we can keep discussing whether demonetization was good, not good. 16 lakh crores money just went out of the system. Now the money has come back. So opposition is now clamoring. They say Congress says, I mean, 
opposition will obviously find, you know, they will hold, uh, dig holes. They say, look, you know, demonetization has failed. But the question is, has it even failed? I mean, see, look, we are getting into this whole digital India kind of situation. People now use mobile phones not just for making calls, which used to be the case. I mean, I can definitely tell you, I mean, we have never used mobile phones in the past for anything else. Today, you want to book a Uber, you want to book a Ola, you want to do transactions. The first thing is you take your mobile phone. You want to do internet search, you do that. Anything and everything you try to complete through mobiles. I'm sure you would have covered disruption. I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much on disruption because I was told yesterday you had a, a program. But look at the evolution. Look at the evolution. Miniature versions keep on happening. I mean, there's one leads to another. You, already the desktops are gone. Laptops will also lose its value. At some stage, everything is changing. You know, today, we, end of the day, you're talking about cars. You know, one, one, somebody says, look, I know how to drive a car. You know, drivers try to charge you a ransom. At some stage, you know, if the whole country is getting into a driverless cars, where is the job for drivers? That, that the job has lost its meaning. I don't know if you're familiar. I mean, Doordashan, I mean, once upon a time, used to have something called, you know, the announcers used to come and uh, tell the programs, you know, this is a program and all. So those jobs have all gone. Secretary jobs, stenographers. Are you familiar? Stenographers and all used to be there. Gone. No jobs. So be very careful. You know, please understand, as you embark on your journey, and this is very important, into the 21st century, you are all going to graduate out from, the, from a good institution. What is staring at you people? What is that which is staring? And I can share my experience. I've been almost, what, 30 odd years now. We didn't know when we started our journey, we had no clue what to do. You're all fortunate, you know, to, to sort of have some people coming and sharing their experience, which is, you know, which is really, really helpful in today's world. It's a tough world you're going to see, mind you. This is a borderless world. You know, it's a world where people are not going to, you know, when you go for a job, for example, when you go to an interview, you have to be sure what is the passion you have. What is that you want to drive in your life? Recruiters are not here to sort of help you. Recruiters are trying to find from you how good you are in the job. You have to drive your passion. It's very important. <clears throat> please, when you go for a job, for an interview, I mean, please make sure that you are dead sure what you want to do in life. The second thing is show energy. When, when you go for, a, for any uh, interview, you know, please, I mean, if I have to look for, somebody asks me, what is that you look for you know, if you're seeing some candidate? Energy is very important. In today's world, this is a tough life. I mean, telling you, 21st century corporate life is difficult. And I'm not scaring. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not scaring anyone here. One has to be mindful. One has to be, uh, you know, sort of clear about what is that which is staring at us. It's a situation where work-life balance can be completely disturbed. You know, you may not have a work-life balance. You may work from, you know, whatever time to whatever time. It may go and end of the day you may, you know, achieve doing, you may feel that, look, I've done nothing in my life because it can sap you, it can take your energies off. So it's very important that you understand what is that you are doing. What is 21st century now looking at? I mean, in terms of the country, in terms of regulations. Things are changing like this. There are opportunities. Please understand, if you're a, a finance person for a moment, if you want to do fundraising, go to a, a company where, you know, they, they come and tell you, come on, you are an MBA from one of the prestigious, uh, you know, schools. Help us with some ideas. How do you, you know, 
fund this project. You have to sort of get your hands dirty, you know, end of the day, and try to look for possible avenues. There are avenues, please understand, there are lots of avenues. But in, you have to be innovative. Innovation is very important. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world where there are many opportunities. Opportunities are coming to you. But it's a question of how much we understand and how much we sort of, you know, take it. Get into a situation, you know, let's, let's talk about human behavior, 21st century, corporate life. I, I can tell you 30 years back when we all started our career, we were dead scared of our bosses. There was nothing like calling somebody by the first name. You could not even dare to do that. You'll have to call that person with all respects. Today, you go, to a, you go and work in a multinational company or, or a forward-looking company in India. It's a, it's a completely different feeling. But it doesn't mean that you don't respect the person. You respect, but you are colleagues. You are colleagues, and expectations from you are even higher. You know, just because somebody pats you on, on the shoulder, just because somebody talks to you well, somebody gives you a good lunch, it doesn't mean that, you know, your responsibilities have eroded. As I mentioned, it's a borderless world. You will have a situation where you will be deputed. Say you will be traveling somewhere. You may go abroad, you may sit with rub shoulders with a lot of people outside. What is that you need to do? Please understand, specialization, be good in your subject. Be very good in your subject because things are changing. Things are changing by, by every second, every hour, things are changing. So it's very important that one has to be on top of whatever is happening. At least this government is doing something, sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. The previous government probably was in hibernation. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not a... BJP versus Congress kind of, uh, there's no sort of thing, but we all know the previous government uh, was, you know. Look, I think the country now has to go to the 21st century. I mean, we are, we are already 17 years into it. India is, is a 2.2 trillion economy country compared to China, which is what? 228 trillion. We are nowhere near China at this point of time. What did China do? 1978, they opened up the economy. We did 13 years later, 1991, at a slow pace. Our base was very small. The growth rate which we proudly pat ourselves, saying that we are moving at 5.5, 6%, whatever, it's on a lower base, please understand, at a very lower base. So the quantum of growth to GDP is going to be nothing significant from an absolute number point of view. So you've got to push this. One has, to, one has to appreciate the government, one has to appreciate Prime Minister Modi. He is looking at India like a businessman, I mean like a typical businessman. You have to move this economy, you have to give a kickstart. He is encouraging all of you, you know, Youngsters, please understand, India out of the 1.3 billion, data says by 2019, your median age is going to be 29, and almost 0.5 billion are going to be in that age profile. 0.5 billion, which is what? Less than half, but I'm a 40 person. Huge, huge number, we are talking about a very young population, and you are the drivers for all this. Please understand, you have an opportunity. This is a great opportunity given to all of you as you embark on this journey into the 21st century. It's very important that one has to keep looking at different opportunities. What do corporates do, like when you, for example, when you go into a job, please don't expect companies to be static. It's not that who I see the chalra, the salsi chalra, pandra salsi chalra, the same thing will be happening and carrying on. It will not. 
Corporates are continuously trying to reinvent, change themselves, adapt themselves. What is it they are doing? They are getting into new areas, new products. Once again, we, I'm sure you have talked about disruption, you know, things like that. So I don't want to give example, but typically the Blackberries and Nokia examples are very clear. What did Nokia, I mean, where did they go wrong? Sorry? They just saw everything coming. They saw everything coming, but they were quiet. Today they're trying to bring in coming, coming with a smartphone. I mean, it, maybe it's too late. Already the market is wiped off. Somebody has taken away the market share. It's very important that you people are drivers. I mean, look at data coming from some of the top management schools. People are joining startups today. Startup India, which is your, one of the other initiatives under PM Modi. There are so much of benefits given. You know, I don't know whether you're even aware of this, that commercial banks have a priority lending for startups. In fact, I was talking to the GM of one of the bank, and he said, look, I have a budget which I need to allocate. Otherwise, I'll be asked questions why you are not even allocating money. And who are the startup top people we are talking? All of you on the, on the floor here. If you have the passion, supposing you have an idea, you are an entrepreneur by heart, this era gives you the opportunity. It's a great, I would say, I mean, I, 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 for want of words, all I can tell you is the country is opening its doors for you. It's up to you whether you want to take it or you just want to you know, let it slip. And I'm not saying being in a job is bad, but there are people who are entrepreneurs by heart. Maybe you know, they have a family business or they, they probably want to do something on their own. So please, please, my only humble request is look at the opportunities around. There are a lot of tax concessions you will get. There are a lot of... Uh, you know, there are fast-track clearances. Some governments have been, some ministries have been told to clear projects in 24 hours. It's all single window clearance. <clears throat> it's all about ideas. And please understand, if you have an idea, there are, in today's world, there are lots of opportunities. I mean, Outside people look for funding projects in India. India is the destination. Everybody is looking at India because of a very, very proactive government. Make the country even more open. See, uh, we, st we started discussing about the whole journey. 30 years back, the country was not open. Throw the whole thing open. Today, the Indian rupee is not even fully convertible. It's not fully convertible. On the capital account side, it's not convertible. So try to make, make the right noises. Today already the government is saying make in India, skill in India, you know, skill India, uh, digital India. I mean, there are so many slogans, so many initiatives which have already been started. Try to give this a push. Try to bring this money into the country for one of these initiatives. You see, uh, quite honestly, I think the government can do only that much. They can sort of make the noises. They can sort of, uh, uh, you know, open up, you know, give tax concessions, reduce, uh, you know, uh, I mean, any, any stumbling blocks, remittances back and forth. They can do all the, uh, the, I mean, create the right atmosphere for people to sort of do. But, I mean, see, end of the day, it's a marketing campaign. You will have to do a little bit of marketing campaign to the people outside. Give the right initiative, because today there's a perception, I don't know if you're all familiar, India is still seen as a difficult place to do business. You know, on, we have around 195 countries in the globe, I mean less than 200, and we are still in that 120, 125, we are oscillating as one of the most difficult countries to do business. I mean, a small country like a New Zealand or a Norway will be so, so ahead. I mean, that's unfortunate. So you, 
end of the i mean the government has to sort of do that and i think the government has already started doing that you know trying to sort of uh, make those right noises so that this money which is lying outside is brought into the economy because india the standard of you see please understand we we are all very happy with uh, gdp and all but its gdp also is very lopsided the country grows only in few cities your pune would have grown your bangalore would have grown your um, chennai would have grown mumbai would have grown delhi would have grown but there are so many villages so many towns so many satellite places which are uh, you know where people are still not finding employment so you have to make this a reality this whole uh, make in india campaign which the prime minister you know sort of unveiled is yet to take off in a big way it's it's sort of starting but you know it's not taken off so you need those capital to come in you have to encourage people to bring everything into the country only then you you will make it a productive asset otherwise it'll all remain in paper there are two ways of looking at life either you are adventurous and try to do something or you are a very safe player you don't want to do anything chodo matlab i'm happy with whatever i'm doing this government has been a little more adventurous please understand there is a very interesting statistics any government which has introduced gst and remember 160 countries have already out of 195 160 countries in the globe already have gst and not a sorry i'll just uh, give a very interesting data not a single head of state has come back to power and mr modi is not a fool i mean he's quite aware of this so what he did as a first step see gst is a, is going to be a very evolving process the principle of equivalence was adopted they just wanted to be revenue neutral in other words this whole excise duty customs var shared i mean there are so many things right everything got subsumed into one act called gst which is very complicated even today it's actually more complicated than those laws but they have just brought five slabs they also know that this is not going to stay in fact arun jetli has been on public forum saying that i want to compress that whether it gets into one or two one doesn't know but definitely you know you see this convergence happening as we go along you know please understand india is a difficult country 29 states i don't know god alone knows how many union territories six or seven whatever uh, my geography is not great so i think 29 plus 7 is what i believe so it's very difficult because states want a lion's share some of the states are manufacturing states maharashtra tamil nadu they lost money because what has happened in gst is the point of taxation has shifted to the consuming state so these people who were manufacturing they they kind of started cribbing so it's not very easy and this is a very heterogeneous country india is like a continent please understand uh you know if, even if you go to uh, united states which is a far bigger country it's supposed to be a federal uh, you know it's kind of a state there is lot of unanimity people think alike india it's impossible you know you're sitting in pune you will think differently you go to uh, chennai you people will think differently you go to i don't know how many of you have travel to northeast the whole country looks so diff- i mean the whole state looks like a separate country they have no idea for example if you go and ask them who is narendra modi they may not even know that narendra modi is the prime minister of the country that's the kind of uh, you know diversity you have in india so one has to implement this in a very uh, you know step by step methodical manner only it may happen at some point so more than questions i actually wanted some thoughts you know uh, what what is the gut feel today i mean seven we are, we all talking about 21st century we are happy happy go lucky people are we all thinking that corporate life is very simple are we making it very simple what is the expectation from corporate life as you all get into a job okay uh, sir i want to know your take on uh, like should we uh, 
embrace the idea of bullet train or should we focus more on the current railway system? You know, bullet train, um, it's got its advantages in the sense uh, it's meant for a journey between two stations. It's obviously going to help the business people around. The whole cost, if you look at it, has been subsidized to such a level because Japan, Japanese government is driving this. And uh, if you look at the return on investment calculations, it's been given, uh, you know, it's almost like a ridiculous rate, something like 1.5% interest rate and there is a moratorium period, um, which, which actually means that only when you get revenue from that, you are going to repay back to the Japanese government. The Japanese government almost has given it like a gift. We are all happy to receive gifts. We don't like to give gifts. I mean, we, somebody is giving, we are happily we have taken it. So, <clears throat> from, from a finance point of view, from a number point of view, this is not a big deal. It's, it's a great play. But it's a billion dollar question whether bullet train has to be there or our normal trains have to be, because as I said, once again, we are all talking about 21st century, we are all uh, very excited with mobile phones, smartphones, uh, you know, iPhone 8, iPhone 9, tomorrow iPhone 10, Tesla cars. I mean, see, end of the day, we are all very happy. MacBooks, we, we get excited with all this. But when we get into a small thing like boarding a railway train, and the railway stations, what we see, even we are in the 21st century, mind you. Are we all happy? No. We are not happy because sometimes the water will not come. Sometimes the food what is served in the train is very bad. The toilets maybe may not be in a very hygienic condition. You could have fights, you know, the reservation system may not have worked very well. So, end of the day, I think, in my view, it, it is a balance. You need to focus on that also. There was this whole idea of privatizing railways. It is still there. Uh, the previous railway minister wanted to do it. But for some reasons, and please understand, I think the government was focused more on GST. They were focused on, and this whole demonetization, uh, really, that took a heavy toll. So they dropped it off. But I'm sure it is there in the agenda. I know for sure I, I am privy to some of these conversations. I have been with some of the you know, uh, conversations. The government is very serious to bring those aspects also into play. I think in my view, and I, once again, I'm not a Modi Bhakt or a Modi hatred person. In, they say about Narendra Modi, you can be only two. Either you are a Modi Bhakt or you are a Modi hatred. There's no middle path. Because he is as dynamic as that. <clears throat> there is a perception today that this government may come back to power at this point of time because apparently, you know, the, the way the trend is moving. I think you will see more traction in the second term because what will happen at that time is some of those numbers which the government wanted in the Rajya Sabha for implementing some of these initiatives would have come to them. So then you will see more traction because I think the first term has been more of settling down, finding their feet, understanding how to sort of run this economy. Because mind you, please understand, for them also it's new. Mr. Modi has been a Gujarat chief minister for 10, 11 years. But to handle a center and you know that to have such a heterogeneous country, it's not an easy deal. And also, uh, the country was not in a great position as they, as they took over in 2014. So it's been a journey full of challenges. I mean, GST itself has taken so much time, if you look at it. I mean, it's been, they've discussed, discussed, but somewhere they brought it. So second term, if, if they get re-elected, I think you will definitely see some of these initiatives, and I'm sure we all will see a better India at this point of time. More, I mean, see, end of the, all this Make in India campaign and Digital India, we, we talk, all they will, will start taking a more, uh, you know, concrete shape. Today it's a little more in theory, it's a little high level, probably at 10,000 feet above sea level. It all will start percolate to the ground level as we, 
you know, sort of go along. Sir, uh, the Indian retail sector is uh, organizes 8.3 percent and un unorganizes 92.7 uh, percent. Uh, and GST, do you think whether the organized sector, uh, the unorganized sector, will be converted into organized because of the CGST and SGST or imposed on the organized sector? People are shifting to the unorganized uh, sector to buy the products. So, if I understood right, you are saying uh, whether this unorganized sector will convert in, into an organized sector. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Because, but this, because of GST, it is discouraging the unorganized sector to convert into organized sector. So, okay, let me, let me kind of tell you, uh, the whole attempt of the government is uh, to make everyone more regulated. Okay. Uh, this whole discussion about organized and unorganized sector, sometimes, you know, it's misunderstood, misconstrued. What GST attempts to do is to sort of make people, and this is all linked to digital India, this is all linked to demonetization. Today, if you look back, what is that, the, the whole thrust? What is demonetization? What is digital India, if you look at it? Just give me one bullet point. It's all about trying to bring in transparency. You know, they're trying to make it transparent. So today what happens, you know, you go to a medical shop, go to a, a, a grocery, any, any person, he's very reluctant to give you a bill. He, I'm, I'm not talking now, pre-GST. People were not happy. People said, no, no, why do you want a bill? You will then tell him, no, no, I may require a bill for some reimbursement and all. Then reluctantly, he will say, chalo, theek, I'll give it to you. The, exactly this is what they want to avoid. They want people to sort of, you know, fall into a path. Please understand, they have made it very simple. That compounding scheme, there's a this scheme called compounding scheme which was giving an exemption up to 75. In fact, two days back, they've increased it to one crore. Up to one crore transaction for the small, small traders. It, we are talking about 1% in some cases, 2% in, in some cases, and just file a quarterly return, which is a very, very simple one-page return. It's not complicated for them at all. So. This whole talk of unorganized sector becoming organized, yes, I mean, that's going to be the attempt. The attempt is to bring this country, we are talking about 21st century, we are talking about what is the direction we all should get into. We all should start believing that transparency, accountability, the openness, sharing of information, and be honest, pay that 1%, 2% is what you are expected to do. So you will fall into what is called as an organized sector, in, in a way, from a governmental point of view. So it helps you to sort of get more regulated. So that's the direction. I mean, uh, I don't know whether you, is that the question or you have something else in mind you, you, could, you could ask me. It's, all, it's almost the same. What? Okay. See, I, I just wanted to tell, give a broad thing, you know. See, I, I do remember, I'll, I'll tell you one very interesting thing in my uh, past, you know. Those days, what used to happen, there were no computers. This whole transparency, we're talking about accountability, transparency and all. Sharing of information used to be a big task in those days, because it was all under a manual system. And you go to an accountant in a, in a company or a, some guy sitting, HR, you know, person, payroll data, People will just keep everything close chested. They would not reveal anything those days. So today the, the world, I mean the whole direction of computerization is to make this whole thing become more transparent. So transparency is what all of us are attempting, even the government at a very you know, macro level. I mean I just thought, I just wanted to give this as a side comment. Any more thoughts? Uh, sir, this is Shivani. My question to you is that uh, in today's world, we are facing a lot of disruption and new technologies are taking up the pace. So what is your take on the employment rate of our generation in future? Because of disruption? Yes, sir. That's a good question. 
please understand uh, this is the world of specialist it's like uh, let's talk about a cricket team a cricket team should have how many batsmen five batsmen five six you take six batsmen 11 batsmen okay six batsmen you need bowlers specialist you need one or two all rounders also now after kapil dev you got some nice all rounder pandya right he is doing seems to be doing well to your question disruption is there you can't avoid things are changing people who will be successful i mean on this in this audience who are all going to be the people who are going to make it big are people who are nimble footed who are very adaptable please understand you have to embrace change embrace the, I, and i'm sure you all of you because you are all young but please also understand in in today's world there are a lot of people who might go out of jobs i'm i'm not talking about people on this or in this audience there are people who have seen life in a different way who have worked in a different way who may not have embraced technology who may not have embraced change they may go out of shape so it's it's change is inevitable things are going to happen you will have situations where I, as i mentioned i mentioned about uh, driverless car i mentioned today if i am a driver if i am making my living through driving i may not be able to get a job 10 to 15 years from now then may not be a job i told you about secretary stenographers there used to be those stenographers who used to write shorten and all now i don't know who know shorten at all i mean nobody none of us even have learned shorten so things are changing so you will have a situation where you will have to adapt yourself the country is also going through a lot of changes you know donald trump people like donald trump he's a disruption himself imagine uh, nobody even thought at 15 days before the us election the republican party said please drop out of the election we'll find a different candidate there was no hope but he got elected so we don't know we are dealing with absolutely you know uncontrollable factors tomorrow if he goes and does some war with in some place it's going to disrupt the economy then suddenly you will say okay the it sector could be very badly affected because some of the companies in the us may start downsizing their budget they may he's already started you know talking about uh, it industry pharma industry these are all disruptions so the question is should you should you remodel you have to remodel you cannot think that look see it's very important in a job please i also understand this is very important <clears throat> you have to do what the market wants you to do and you will have to have your passion also tailored this is like a mix mix and match is like the husband and wife at some stage when you, all of you will get married i'm sure you will have to match the contrasting styles you will have passion but the market wants something from you because your passion could be something as i mentioned it industry you you want to be a code coding uh, person uh, personality there may not be a market for the it industry maybe the coders are not wanted at all so you will have to model your thought process your your strengths your focus into that so your question is whether we will go out of place whether we lose job possibly yes some of them yes definitely we lose jobs you know just think of it taxation income tax act i'll take a simple example income tax act could be abolished it's possible in the country there are i know there are so many tax experts who have made businesses who have thrived what will happen to them nobody knows there's no answer to that so you will have to keep yourself extremely conscious of these things and keep yourself little adaptable otherwise uh, what will happen is uh, you know you you will 
suddenly feel that uh, the same thing what happened to Nokia or a Blackberry or you know any of these people. I mean, you could simply disappear from the market in no time. Uh, so my question is, uh, sir, out of 401 uh, billion forex reserve, more than 50% uh, is through FPI. And FPI can be uh, withdraw at any time, like it's a hot money. So how can we say that uh, our economy is a efficient uh, forex reserve? You said FDI or uh, Well, uh, sufficient is a very relative term. I never used the word sufficient. All I said was we have improved from where we were. Um, please understand FDI, let's understand the difference between FDI and uh, FI, you know, FI, uh, the investment portfolio. You're talking about investment portfolios, right? Correct? Yeah. It, you're right, it's night flight money. It can disappear. But there must be, once again, you know, you have to be a little conscious of the government at a very macro level has to be very conscious of this. What could be the triggers for this money to move out of the country? What could be the triggers? It is just that people who had invested in the in the economy, in the country, now feel that, look, this destination is not the right destination. Let's move to a different destination. Let's look for newer areas. Imagine the US. Today, US, the LIBOR, which is the, the reference rate, USD LIBOR, has been moving up. It was 0.6. Now, as we speak, it has come to 1.5. And there is this whole uh, program which they are doing, QE program, you know, so it may push up the interest rates in the US. So if it goes to 2% plus, money could go out of it. Definitely money could go out. If tomorrow the Indian government does something very silly, you know, the laws are, uh, you know, they introduce some retrospective laws, you know, remember those retrospective taxation, things like that. If they do anything like that, money could go out. There could be areas, there could be potential, uh, you know, actions which will make this money go out of the country. So one can control what you can control. See, 401 crores, yes, it's a number. You are right, your number is there, this money is there. The remaining is FDI money. FDI money is safe, generally. Pe people who put money in a project, they are not going to, you come and put a factory near Pune or, a, or a Mumbai. I mean, you can't discard it like that. I mean, you are here for a long time. So th the other money can disappear, but the government should make sure that Whatever they can do to stop the outflow, which is what they can probably control, they should try to do that and hope for the best. And see, please understand, you can't depend on this kind of money because this is like, it's a bonus. And the government also knows that it, it's a bonus. So, lo so long as they're there, they happy about it. You know, beyond that, they, they, they're okay. But generally, by experience, I can tell you money doesn't go, you know, even today for a moment, you know, if you look at the foreign exchange reserves, there is inflow only happening, uh, you know, at this point because India is still now seen as the the biggest destination. India is the market; everybody wants to come. China is going down. Europe is in a very bad situation, and it's for you people. You know, you 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 all take this economy to a different level. In all of you, drive it, make in India, skill India. You know, you bring more and more industries, uh, startups here. Money will come into the country. Because people are looking for opportunities, you know, and stock markets will keep looking better. So I don't see any, if you ask me personally, do you expect money to go out of India in a hurry? No, I don't expect that at all. Okay, just a quick question from my side. What are the three wish lists we all want for to, it to happen, to have a good country? I mean, to say that India, we are proud to be in India, you know. We, see, we all are proud Indians, right? When we play cricket matches, we are very proud. Some, some people have heart attacks and all if India loses. Correct? Sorry? Education system should be? But it's already... Okay, sorry, I'll come to that. Huh? Reservation system should be banned. How many of you believe that reservation system should be completely banned? Can I have show of hands? Wow, that's a number. 
That's a number. My God. You know, you know, it, it goes on to prove one thing that we believe in open competition, correct? Yes, sir. But for that open competition to happen, don't we, don't we feel somewhere in our heart that people on the other side also should have access to libraries, li access to colleges, access to electricity, don't you feel? Yes, no. You know, how many of you know that there are some villages in India, see we are talking about 21st century. There are some villages, please hear this very carefully. Huh? There are some villages in India which do not get electricity. There are no lamps available. I can tell you because my wife is associated with an NGO and uh, one of the largest NGO. And they give solar energy. There are some villages where they, in one room in a home, there's no electricity. How can they compete? I mean, spare a thought. While I completely take your point, I'm very happy to see the reaction that all of us want open competition. But it should be an apple to apple comparison and it should be a level playing field, correct? Are we, are we sort of aligned on that? Point taken. It should be based on income. It should be based, based on equal opportunities. See, what I'm just trying to say is, um, in the country, unfortunately, see, India is a very, uh, India is a country where some portions of India are very well developed. There are few states, Maharashtra is an example, where you have the tier two and tier three towns well advanced. Tamil Nadu is one example where you got tier two, tier three towns which are pretty good. But not every state can talk about that. I mean, I can tell you, I used to stay in Bangalore. Karnataka, just leave Bangalore. There is nothing beyond that. Mysore is just coming up now. One can't even think beyond Bangalore or Mysore. So, is it balanced development? Is it, uh, should we be happy if only GDP is growing? Any development objective which the government allocates, the budget, you know, you hear the finance minister giving budget, there are a lot of objectives they will talk. Many times there is an implementation issue. But I have to honestly tell you, uh, because as I said, I'm a little privy to certain uh, initiatives which the current government is doing. I think there is some kind of uh, a checks and balances system, some kind of an audit process, where they are trying to make sure, first time it's happening in India, mind you, first time that people are asked to come back, revert with actual data, what has happened to some of those initiatives. So, to your point, whether the reservation system or any uh, overall economic objective, is it going to the right uh, people? No. Answer is no. It may not. Ration public PDS, your public distribution system, ration shops, you know it's one of the biggest laundry kind of mechanism. Government is aware of it. It's not that the government doesn't know. But if, if you can, if you want to abolish today, you say oh, no, no more ration shops. It'll go against them. They can't do a radical measure because you know the vote bank and all those things also have to come into play. So they are handling this very carefully. They're just trying to make sure that there is better implementation and there is some kind of a maker checker concept, some kind of a control process. But to your point, whether it goes exploitation happens. I mean, I, you know, I, I have to tell you very honestly, there are a lot of people who get converted from a forward community to a backward community. Are you aware of it? They're born in a different community. And they decide, oh, come on, this is not, use, this is not useless. Let me change. That's just ridiculous. But they do it because they have to get a job. So, in a sense, you are right, all these reservations should drop off. 
I mean, please understand. For, sit, no, sit down. I'm saying you talk about, we talk about income tax, right? All of us suffer income tax. As we all go, income tax, income tax. The first thing is common cold is a problem, cancer is a problem, income tax is a problem. Correct? None of us have any clue on either of this. Are you aware that 47% of your GDP, which is the agriculture income, is not taxed? And no finance minister in India will have the political willpower to go and introduce agriculture income tax. Don't they know stats? They know it. Your tax to GDP ratio in India is just 10%. No country is in that level. Every country is in a much higher level. US and because people believe in paying taxes. In India, we generally don't like to pay taxes. We try to avoid. Unless we are some policeman is sitting on top. The point is they don't want to do it. They know that this is required. But why exempt? And who are these agriculture people? Please understand. Agriculture is not rice, wheat. No. It's the cash crops. People make money. It's a big business. And see, I have nothing against agriculture lobby. I'm mind you. I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, all I'm saying is this is very important that that portion of the economy is addressed. So people know it, but there are compulsions within which they are supposed to do. Similarly, the, all the reservation system, they know this is all. This was done when the country was in a different level, 50 years back, 60 years back. When you got independence, you had to do it because somewhere down there, India was a poor country. Are you aware, 1947, what was the rupee to dollar equivalent? One rupee. What was it even in 1990? 1990, which is 27 years back. Not even 20, 18 rupees. So, the country was totally different. It's moved now. So, quite honestly, people know most of these issues, but they are doing it in a phased manner. Like, you know, they, they, they just don't have the, the muzzle power and the political sort of bandwidth to do certain things. Because if you, if you suddenly tax agriculture income, they're gone. If you remove restrictions, for example, you know, you talk about all the restrictions, you know, the reservation system. There is a massive vote bank lying there. How can they even leave that? They can't. So that's the problem. They all understand. So within that, what they're trying to do is to, as I mentioned, create a level playing field. You know, try to make those towns, the, the second uh, rank, uh, tier two and tier three towns, make them more enabled so that they can compete with people from cities like Mumbai or Pune or, 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 or Bangalore or wherever. You have to create that. That's the best they can do. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your words of wisdom, for sharing your views and knowledge about FERA and FEMA and how to manage our work-life balance. Thank you for your productive speech on Digital India, Demonetization and the interactive session on the in Indian economy. Thank you, sir.